Any military mission depends for its success on individuals. Individuals working together. A small patrol such as this, a familiar example. Casualties may result from enemy attack. Casualties remove individual men from action. Casualties may cause the failure of a mission. Attack by chemical, biological, or radiological agents has the greatest potential for mass casualties ever known to man. The greatest danger to you and your mission can come from enemy CBR operations. CBR stands for three words, chemical, biological, and radiological, CBR. The term chemical operations covers a lot of ground. And while this isn't exactly a chemical agent, a chemical reaction is involved. Through your military experience, you may already recognize certain chemical operations and some chemical agents. For example, chemical smoke used for concealment. Fire incendiaries, flamethrowers, used to destroy and produce casualties. Some agents producing temporary effects are used for training and riot control. These cause the temporary inability to act and may also be known to you. Other chemical agents may not be known to you. Among these are the toxic chemical agents designed to produce casualties, leaving personnel unable to perform their duties, unable to continue their mission. Blister agents such as mustard will blister, inflame, irritate, and redden whatever tissue they touch, skin, eyes, lungs. The visible effects may be delayed. The damage, once it appears, may last for weeks or even be fatal. There are some chemical agents deadlier than a rattlesnake that may strike without warning. These are the effects of nerve agents. They paralyze the breathing muscles, causing casualties within seconds. Death can occur within a very few minutes. Under certain conditions, a single breath of a nerve agent may be fatal. Frequently, you have been exposed to biological agents. Your body has been combating these since birth. If you have had a cold or measles, chicken pox, or even diarrhea, you already understand the effect of a biological agent and you have survived. Biological operations are simply a man-made attempt to use certain disease-causing agents, biological agents, to produce sickness and casualties on a large scale. Biological agents can be deadly because their effects are delayed. It may be days or weeks before you realize you've been attacked. The first sign may be serious and widespread sickness and even deaths.
If you've ever been x-rayed, you've been exposed to radiation under controlled conditions. Radiological operations, of course, involve dangerous quantities of radiation and great potential danger to personnel under attack. Radiological hazards could come from a nuclear detonation. One effect of a nuclear detonation is intense heat from the fireball. Another effect is blast. It is, of course, many times more powerful than HE blast. Neither heat nor blast are new. A third effect, nuclear radiation, produces another source of danger to personnel. Nuclear radiation cannot be seen or felt. However, special instruments can detect and measure it. Radiation damages body tissues, and too much radiation causes severe sickness or even death. But you should remember that just being exposed to nuclear radiation will not necessarily make you sick. The effect of radiation depends on the amount received and the length of time over which it is received. Your mission should expect attack from any number of enemy sources. Once you identify the source, training tells you what to do. Experienced men act quickly without command to reduce casualties and protect themselves from small arms fire and HE. It's automatic. In the same way, the hazards of CBR attack must be expected and prepared for. Otherwise, in the hands of the enemy, CBR attack could mean a quick end to your ability to carry out the mission. CBR agents can be compared to a sniper with a silencer. You may realize you're under attack only when casualties appear. And so experienced soldiers trained to recognize the effects of a CBR agent act quickly without command to avoid casualties. This too is automatic. Under CBR attack, good training pays off. Knowing what to do and acting effectively requires knowledge. Knowledge of how CBR agents act on your body. Most chemical and biological agents, as well as some radiological agents, must enter your body to do their deadly work. They can enter your body through your eyes, mouth, nose, or skin. Others can do their damage on the surface. Some radiological agents can act at a considerable distance. Your uniform is a good beginning for protection against some chemical agents. It covers and shields much of your skin. It can be chemically treated to provide still better protection. Gloves can be used to protect your hands and ointment applied to protect exposed skin areas. Without the protective mask, the most vulnerable areas, eyes, nose, mouth, and lungs, are exposed. The protective mask is the most important single piece of protective equipment you have against chemical and biological agents. With it, most of the face is covered, and the filter protects the lungs from agents that would have entered through the nose or mouth. Complementing the mask and uniform is the chemical agent's protection and treatment set. It contains gauze pads, protective ointment, and an atropine serrette. The protective ointment is used to neutralize and decontaminate, protecting the skin against blister agents.
The atropine syred is used to block the effects of nerve agents. Your health and physical fitness are a primary and daily concern in the Army. Routines are planned with your well-being in mind. These very routines are powerful weapons against biological agents, producing a healthy body, which helps fight and throw off disease. Taking the required immunization shots and keeping them up to date. Having good personal health habits, clean uniforms, equipment and quarters. Drinking water only from approved sources and eating food prepared under Army supervision. These are some of the means of preventing many effects of biological agents. The danger to you from nuclear radiation depends on many things. The distance from the source, the amount received, and the length of exposure. But the key word to remember is shielding. A thick stone or concrete wall is a good shield. So is an embankment or a trench. A deep covered foxhole prepared in advance is by far the best protection. Remember to dig it so you can fire from the foxhole when your mission requires it. Whatever cover you choose must protect you from radiation. And generally, the more material, the better. Remember, too, there is no time to find cover. If you're caught in the open, don't run for cover. Fall flat on the ground at once. In any case, remain in your shielded position until ordered to move out, unless your mission makes movement essential. CBR agents can be delivered to a target quickly and in quantity with existing methods. For example, mortar and artillery shells, sprays from aircraft, guided missiles and rockets, aerial bombs, mines or grenades, drones and submarines, sabotage or enemy agents behind the lines. Any or all of these methods might be used. CBR agents can be used anywhere probably when they're least expected. CBR agents will surely be used to gain the advantage of surprise and to interrupt the flow of supplies and communications. To counteract surprise, specialists in CBR operations, experts in detecting, locating, and reporting CBR conditions are attached at the appropriate unit levels. You can count on them for prediction, warning, information, and technical advice. But protection against CBR agents is your job. Attack by chemical, biological, or radiological agents has increased the potential and striking power of the military arsenal. The hazards of CBR agents and CBR attack must be expected and prepared for. CBR can stop you cold unless you know what to do. Most CBR agents must enter your body to do their damage. Others work at a distance or on the surface of your body. Be ready to use your protective mask before an attack is expected. Against chemical and biological agents, it is the best protection known.
A deep covered foxhole is the best protection against radiation. You must have something to shield you. The wise soldier understands the dangers of CBR. He respects them, but does not fear them. He heeds warning, follows sound advice, and is ready to take protective steps quickly. Through knowledge and training, he is able to survive and continue his mission. Sharpsburg, Antietam, Gettysburg. The American Civil War was the first great test of the Army Medical Department. Nearly a half million men were wounded, and thousands died who might have lived. Ambulances were few, offering jolting rides over rutted roads. Even the lightly wounded often died of shock or exposure before reaching primitive care. Yesterday's wounded and the medical men who served them could only agree with William Tecumseh Sherman that war was hell. Medical techniques had made great advances by the time of the First World War, but the wounded waited for medical attention almost as long as their grandfathers had a half century earlier. After being hit, a man might suffer through the day before starting the long, rough trip to base hospital, and he sometimes crawled under fire to reach even first aid. The fouled earth upon which the wounded lay for unending hours brought on gas gangrene and usually amputation or death. The Second World War was the most dynamic in history. This blitzkrieg mobility expanded the medical department. Medical care rolled at the heels of attacking troops, and a man struck by enemy fire knew that life-saving attention was seldom far away in time or distance. Morale among the wounded was high, and the survival rate exceeded all expectations. Wheels made such advances possible. Now military medicine waited for a new dimension in the delivery of medical care. First used in Korea, the helicopter provided a vertical dimension to the care of wounded. In Southeast Asia, more than 100,000 injured and wounded were picked up from the battlefield and flown immediately to fully equipped medical facilities in the combat zone. Time was measured in minutes and lives saved. It was the dawn of a new age in American military medicine.
today's soldier, trained for his job better than any in the world, knows that wherever duty may send him, skilled, dedicated medical personnel form a chain of care reaching from foxhole to specialized hospitals in the continental United States. If a soldier is hit, injured, or becomes seriously ill, his needs are urgent and must be met immediately. Medical attention begins at the front line, at the moment of crisis. In addition to treatment, the medic must never forget that careful and correct positioning of the patient is of primary importance in evacuating him to the rear. When no litters are available, or when their use is impractical, the basic method of evacuating a patient from the battlefield is by manual carry. A patient can be carried by one man or two using a variety of techniques. In the interest of the patient's welfare, two-man carries are always preferred, but sometimes a medic must go it alone. Airway obstruction, massive bleeding, fractures and shock, each symptom is checked before the medic prepares to lift the patient from the ground. A wrong move now can endanger the patient's life. combat, there are times when any stand-up carry is dangerous to medic and patient alike. The patient must be dragged to a place where an appropriate carry can begin. The fireman's drag presents a low profile for security, and the heads-up position of the medic provides maximum visibility. A medic with an unconscious patient will find that help is no further away than his and his patient's waist. Two pistol belts joined together form a secure and comfortable loop. With the patient on his back, Draw the loop up under his armpits. Slip the belt loop over your own arm and shoulder, turn, and begin crawling to the nearest cover, preferably in defilade. When safe, another type of carry can be safely used. Dragging a patient is a last resort, but there may be no other choice when a life is at stake. Slightly injured patients may not need to be carried to an aid station, but they will need assistance and guidance. The fireman's carry is the easiest way for one man to carry another and can be used whether the patient is conscious or not. The grip and leverage techniques employed here can be used in other one-man carries. Watch again, noting the position of the medic's feet and the grips employed. Carefully turn the patient face down. 
raise the patient's head and rest it on his forearm so that the mouth and nasal passages are clear of the ground. A firm grip underneath the patient's armpits and the patient is raised to his knees. Then upright. With the patient's knees locked, move to his front and lift him face down across your back. Come up smartly, shifting the weight to achieve balance. Then grip the patient's left wrist with your left hand, leaving the right hand free. Manual carries are not ideal, but they can save lives. If the patient is conscious, the medic may choose a saddleback carry, especially if the patient has a head injury. The saddleback carry keeps the patient's head upright, reducing the flow of blood from the wound. The saddleback carry is more fatiguing to the medic than the fireman's carry, but the nature of the patient's wound may dictate its use. If the patient is unconscious, the pack strap carry should be used. Note that the patient's wrists are not crossed and make sure that his hands are positioned face down before pressure is applied. This is one of the more fatiguing one man carries and can be used only across short distances. Medics faced with long distance carries must consider the element of fatigue as detrimental to the patient's welfare. When a medic gets tired, his pace slows. Arrival at the aid post will be delayed. Stopping to rest means putting the patient down, then picking him up again, and then again. The patient's condition can only deteriorate. Long distance carries are facilitated by using two pistol belts joined as though for the pistol belt drag. Ease yourself backward between the patient's extended legs, placing one arm, then the other through the waiting loops. Moving away from the patient's injured side, Roll over to a face down prone position. A firm grip on the belt is taken before initiating the lift. Raise to a kneeling position, then steadying yourself with your hands, come all the way up. The advantages of the pistol belt carry are easily seen. Pistol belts are not at hand, substitutes can be used. A rifle sling. Two triangular bandages taken from the medic's aid kit. A pair of litter straps or anything else that is long enough and that will not cut or bind the patient's flesh. Two-man carries involve four primary techniques. The simplest method is the support carry used whether the patient is conscious or not. This carry can be used only for the lightly wounded. The saddleback carry is used for the unconscious patient who shows no signs of arm, leg, back, neck, or hip fractures.
you must lift the patient in a single coordinated movement, avoiding uneven shifting of the patient's weight. Head or foot injuries can be moved in safety and comfort using the forehand pack saddle carry, but the patient must be conscious so he can assist in the carry by holding on. An unconscious patient can be carried with support at his knees and at his back. The two-man arms carry serves a dual function. It is a good way to ease a patient onto a litter, and it can be employed to carry an unconscious patient to an aid post when no litter is available. The medics rise smoothly together. The patient is held high against the chest, a position that lessens fatigue during the carry. The patient's welfare is better served by litter transportation than by even the best of manual carries. The ride is easier, he reaches the aid station faster, and chances of aggravating his injury are minimized. There are several kinds of litters used in the field. The standard straight aluminum litter can be handled by two, three, or four men. The litter's standardized configuration allows transfer from any of the multi-service evacuation vehicles, thus avoiding unnecessary stress to the patient, and time is saved. The completely folding litter weighs just under 19 pounds and is primarily used during parachute assault operations. The semi-rigid, poleless litter allows the patient to be bound securely, yet comfortably, by seven web straps from chest to ankles. The supporting rings facilitate handling when the litter must be tilted, as in evacuating a patient down a mountainside or when helicopter extraction is required. Steel, wire mesh, and wooden mountain basket litter is completely rigid. It can be pulled along the ground if necessary without injury to the patient. It is especially useful when conditions dictate that the litter must be tilted during the carry. The journey to an aid station begins with careful placement of the patient on the litter, wrapping him in a blanket to reduce the danger of shock, providing warmth and comfort during the carry. The standard litter squad consists of four bearers, they are almost always medics, but not necessarily frontline medics whose skills are needed as near the fighting as possible. But successful litter carries can be made by two litter bearers alone. The bearer at the rear of the litter watches the movements of the man at the front, anticipating any shift in direction or angle. They must walk out of step to avoid rhythmic motion that would cause distress to the patient. They run with the litter only if a steady walk would endanger their lives. Generally, the litter patient is carried feet first, but when going uphill, his head should be pointing forward.
the feet first position is assumed when starting down. In the field, the medic's best ally is common sense. The advantages of a four-man litter team are never more apparent than when negotiating terrain broken by natural and man-made obstacles. Fences are crossed by smooth teamwork, keeping the patient's comfort always in mind. Moving a patient safely across a battlefield trench or deep ditch requires the same harmony of effort, fluid, synchronized motions that become automatic with practice. Transporting a litter patient through thickly planted trees requires shifting to a single file carry. the confining area, the point and the trail bearers resume their positions at the grips. Water barriers can be safely crossed using the right techniques. Before crossing the stream, the bearers align themselves in tandem underneath the litter. The tallest two medics grip the handles at front and rear. The shorter pair grips the stirrups. If the water is too deep or the current is too strong, the patient is better floated across on a rubber raft or air mattress. Again, common sense will dictate the method. Ingenuity, the ability to improvise a workable substitute when standard issue is not available, is an American trademark. Medics may find themselves in need of litters when none are available but there are many ways to create serviceable litters from objects in the field. A blanket and two poles will make a litter. So will branches taken from a tree, links of pipe, rifles or skis, when combined with a shelter half, a tarpaulin, blanket or similar tough material. Corners cut from sacks, bed ticking, or mattress covers allow them to be fitted over poles. Even field jackets can be used. But make sure poles are passed through the sleeves and that buttons are secure.
If substitute poles cannot be found, the patient can be carried short distances in a blanket, shelter half, or poncho rolled at the edges. The rolls serve as grips. Four men are needed for this carry. Doors taken from a ruined building provide firm support for injured backs. The patient must be securely strapped to the door's flat surface. In all cases, transfer patient to a standard litter as soon as possible. The litter team's responsibility to any one patient picked up on the battlefield ends only when the patient has been delivered safely into the hands of the nearest medical facility. Moving a patient is more than just transportation. It is care. Wheeled vehicles designed expressly for transporting patients from forward areas to aid stations and medical facilities in the rear are used whenever possible. The patient reaches his destination faster, is more comfortable, and medical care can be provided en route. To the patient needing immediate surgical attention, the approach of an ambulance on the field is a signal of hope and a promise of attention. This frontline ambulance is able to work all the way up to the forward edge of the battle area. Manned by a team of two, this quarter-ton vehicle accommodates three litter patients or six ambulatory patients or a combination of the two. The loading sequence is right upper, left upper, and center. Medical elements of mechanized units must have similar evacuation capability. This fully tracked armored ambulance can serve as a mobile aid station. With the ramp down, four litter patients can be accommodated inside the carrier. This six-wheel drive, single-unit ambulance, the Gamma Goat, is not only capable of omni-terrain transportation, it can also cross deep water by swimming. The Gamma Goat ambulance has a crew of two and can carry three litter patients. In motion, the sole means of communication between the driver and the medic is a light system operated from the patient compartment. The five-quarter ton, four-wheel drive truck ambulance is the workhorse of the medical department. Its weight and size gives the patient a more comfortable ride and the interior is impervious to wind and rain. This ambulance can accommodate 10 ambulatory patients or four litter patients or two litter patients and five ambulatory. With the aisle clear, the medic can see to the comfort of his patient while the ambulance rolls toward its destination.
Each squad member assists in making the berths secure as litters are put aboard. The more seriously injured are loaded last so they can be taken out first. Head, chest, and abdomen wounds and those wearing cumbersome splints are always loaded into lower berths. Many Army vehicles, not expressly designed for ambulance work, can be pressed into service when the occasion demands. The quarter-ton utility truck, the classic Jeep, is one of them. It can carry one litter patient by itself and three with the attached trailer. The vehicles can go almost anywhere the infantry can, but medical care while underway is not feasible. The five-quarter-ton truck is another general-purpose vehicle that can be used for the transportation of patients. Three litters can be placed on the gate walls and two on the floor. Although normally used for carrying heavy cargo, the two and a half ton wide bed truck can be used to transport up to a dozen litter patients. Loading can be carried out in any conventional order, but bearers must be careful not to obstruct the placement of one litter by the premature loading of another. The bus ambulance is capable of transporting 44 ambulatory patients, and with modification, the bus will accommodate 18 litters and four attendants. The conversion kit carried on the bus contains every needed accessory to convert the bus into a litter-carrying ambulance. The bus ambulance can be used in support of the Army in the field, wherever the road network and the tactical situation will allow. The total conversion time from removal of seats to installation of all 18 litters requires about 20 minutes. The bus is especially useful in transporting large numbers of patients over short distances, from hospitals to airheads, railheads, ports of embarkation, and there is ample room inside for en route medical care of every patient. The third dimension. There is no terrain in the air, only an environment. Machines in the sky transcend time, eclipsing distance. Two birds of mercy, 14 wounded men moving towards salvation at 150 feet per second. The battle for life can be won or lost in minutes, and evacuation by air spells the difference. elevated by the knowledge that any special medical care he may need can quickly be provided. The speed, range, and flexibility of medevac helicopters allow selected patients to be flown directly to teams handling particular wounds and injuries. Where it might take agonizing hours to hand carry a patient down a mountainside or cliff face, the familiar Huey can have him safely away in minutes. Conscious patients can get aboard hovering helicopters using the forest penetrator.
allow the penetrator to touch the ground before grabbing. The aircraft builds a considerable charge of static electricity, electricity looking for a place to discharge. The medevac helicopter can accommodate six litter patients whose condition is stabilized. When operating with unstabilized patients, the three litter configuration is used. Patients in an unstable condition need constant care, and the medics need all the room possible in the aircraft interior. The loading sequence is top berth first, middle berth second, and lower berth last. Patients requiring special treatment or dressings are loaded in the middle tier, where they are more easily reached for the care they need. In this configuration, an additional four ambulatory patients can be evacuated. Every safety precaution must be observed when preparing to offload patients. Always approach the aircraft from the front so that the pilot can see you coming. Always crouch low on approach. Litters must be kept clear of main rotor systems. In moving from one side of the aircraft to the other, never go around the rear. Always make the crossover by moving around the front. Profiles are kept low. Eyes observe not the rotor blades, but the ground ahead. And finally, Safety and security for the patient in the hands of the waiting medical teams. Today's frontline Army medics are prepared to meet the challenge and the responsibility of transporting the sick and wounded with the skill and dedication long a tradition in American military medicine. The responsibility is ultimate, that of life itself. Yeah.